Okay, we get active. Dig into your pockets, your wallets, your bags. Take out a piece of documentary, an ID document, a password. Um, it could be your password, or passport. It could be your driver's license and take a look at it. There's your name, there's your date of birth, there's a place, but most importantly, there's a number. Everyone in this room exists. Today I'm going to talk about people who do not exist. I'm going to talk about the underworld of cities, places that many people do not know. I'm going to take you on a journey into the underworld of the inner city of Johannesburg. Now we're here today to talk about City 2.0. And I believe that there are multiple levels of reality in a city. And although my talk is very specific of the city of Johannesburg, I believe that underworlds exist in all cities, including Berlin, or perhaps especially Berlin, and that a lot of the realities that people face in these underworlds are the same all across the world. But in order for you to understand the complexity of the underworld of the inner city of Johannesburg, you need to understand its history you need to understand that Johannesburg was built on the backs of mine workers who came from the rural areas into the city to work in the gold mines. You need to understand that Johannesburg was built on a legacy of apartheid, which was a social system which divided society according to race. And perhaps the cruelest part of apartheid was that it dictated where people lived and where they were free to move. But Johannesburg always remained where the money was. It's the city of gold. And all the city's big corporations and banks had their headquarters in the city. But as apartheid was coming to the end of its era, democracy was on the horizon, many of these companies took fright. They literally moved their businesses out of the inner city into other suburbs on the outskirts. They emptied their buildings of employees, of furniture, they put a big padlock on the door, and they turned their backs. But when you create a ghost town of buildings, you need to have its ghosts. And so people started moving into these buildings. All sorts of people. They were migrants, they were the destitute, they were refugees, asylum seekers. People who, who needed a place of refuge. And so what used to be beautiful apartments, um, beautiful offices, soon became people's homes. What were offices and boardrooms. Were then subdivided, people started to build shacks within the buildings. And with time, these buildings started to, to degrade. There was no water, no electricity supply to these buildings. And ultimately, these, these buildings which were beautiful became slum buildings. And with the slum buildings came the slum lords, who started to run these buildings like businesses. They would demand rent from tenants, and if they didn't pay, they'd be beaten up and kicked out. Although there was no facilities within the buildings. So basically, there were these vertical squatter camps in the center of Africa's wealthiest city. And my connection to the inner, to the inner city of Johannesburg, to the underworld, started when a, a good friend, a great photographer called Pep Bonnet, he'd been sent on an assignment to, by MSF to document the lives of, of Zimbabwean refugees living in these buildings. And he came back with pictures where I couldn't believe my eyes. I couldn't believe that this reality was taking place in the center of the city that I grew up in. And so I had, I had to see it for myself, and I did. And Pep and I, we soon agreed that we should try and document the inner city. We needed to tell the story. We need to show the world that there was this reality taking place in the center of Johannesburg. And so we, we also realized that it wasn't enough just to take photos and for me to write the stories. We had to give the voice to the people of the city. So we decided to produce a documentary film. So this is our team. And actually, when I look at this picture, I'm reminded of the three wise monkeys who hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil, except that our purpose was to see, hear, and speak of all that we saw and met in the inner city of Johannesburg. And many people ask me, so how do you access these buildings? Where's the gateway to the inner city? And actually, it's a little bit like Harry Potter, when he goes down onto the station to board the Hogwarts Express, and he needs to go onto the platform nine and three quarters. The gateway to the inner city is just off center, and lies in a rather unexpected place. 
the Central Methodist Church of the inner city of Johannesburg, right next to the High Court. Now, this church is run by a man called Bishop Paul Verain, a quite remarkable individual, and he did something rather unexpected with his church. He opened the doors of the church to the city's poor and destitute and marginalized. He allowed the building to be used as a place of refuge. But then in 2008, there was this wave of xenophobic attacks across South Africa, where foreigners were being targeted, and not only by some local South Africans, but also by the police. And word soon spread through the inner city that there was a place that people could go. And before Bishop Paul Verain knew what was coming, he had somewhere between three and 5,000 people living in his church, and another 2,000 people that slept on the pavement outside. His, church became a refugee camp overnight. Now the whole situation has calmed down, but to this day there's still about a thousand people that sleep in that church every day. So that was where we started. That's where we met our fixer, who gave us access to the underworld, into the, into the buildings that surrounded the inner city, well, that surrounded the church. And that's how we got to know people. And what did we discover? we discovered that according to MSF, there are about 1,300 slum buildings in the inner city of Johannesburg. We discovered that there are some 250,000 people that live in these buildings. That's a quarter of a million people. That's equal to the size of the, of the population of Kreuzberg in Berlin, who officially do not exist. We discovered that there's a lot of garbage lying around. There's no one that clears the waste, there's sewage. There's rats everywhere. There's no running water, so people have to go elsewhere to look for water. And all of this needs to be remembered within the context of Johannesburg, one of the world's most violent cities. There's this element of violence that runs through society and through these buildings, that the safety of women and children in these spaces, it's, it's pretty intense. But then perhaps what strikes you the most when you're in these buildings is the darkness. And it's, a, it's not a darkness like night, it's a, because even night has its light. It's a darkness that you cannot see the floor you're standing on. You don't have a sense of what walls are next to you. You use your mobile phone to navigate through these squatter camps that have been built and shacks that have been built within the buildings. And suddenly a door opens and you see a candle and you see that life is being lived in these small places. And you realize that ultimately, we're just people trying to get on with our lives. But in these dark spaces, and in this dark world, there are dark stories. And I'd like to introduce you to Thomas Kanawera. To be honest, I hesitated on whether I should include his story in today's talk, because it's a tough one. And TEDx is about passion and dreams and vision. But then I thought, actually, Thomas is about that too. He's a man with a dream, a dream for freedom, freedom to express himself, freedom to vote for the leader of his choice. But in Thomas's case, that dream almost cost him his life. Thomas was a, he's a Zimbabwean. Um, he was a member of the opposition party against the regime of Margo, uh, Robert Mugabe. He was an outspoken youth and realized that his life was in danger. So he fled Zimbabwe. He crossed the border illegally into South Africa, thinking that he would be safe. But Robert Mugabe's agents followed him across the border. They came to him in the night. They dragged him out of his house, tied his hands and legs with wire, poured diesel all over his back, and set him alight. He woke up six weeks later in hospital, and where he had to stay for another six months. Today, Thomas is a man on the run. And it wasn't easy to track him down. Pep had met him on the first visit when he was in Johannesburg. So when we got there and tried to find him, we, had to, we ended up driving about 400 kilometers out of Johannesburg to meet with him and to record his story. And while we were talking with him, I said to him, but Thomas, why are you actually willing to talk to us when by sharing the story, you possibly put your life in even more danger? And his response was, what would all of my suffering have been worth if no one would hear my story? What would, what would it all have been worth? My body, my story, my life is witness to what is taking place in Zimbabwe today. Thomas has paid the, the price for all of our freedoms. But of course, the inner city is not all about dark stories. And all I can say is thank goodness for the children, 
because children bring light into the darkest of places. Children have this ability to laugh, to play, to bring joy. And of course, it would be naive to say that all stories of children in the inner city are happy ones. But we did discover that there is this continuous flow of hands that raise the children of the shadows. And one of these women, there was one person called Ruth. And Ruth, she had a great impact on me. She's a woman from Zimbabwe. She's in her mid-50s. She fled Zimbabwe because her house had been burnt down by the regime's forces. And she came and, as with all many refugees, started at the Central Methodist Church and then went out and ended up moving into one of the slum buildings in the inner city. She lives on the eighth floor next to a community of blind people. And often in what we found in the inner city, a lot of people with disabilities tend to live together because they offer each other protection and support. So every day she watched the parents of blind children go down the stairs into the streets to beg, taking their children with them. So she approached the parents and said, why don't you leave your kids with me? I'll take care of them. So what started with, with a couple of children soon became 10, 25. Now Ruth runs an informal creche within the inner city, within the slum building in which she lives. This is a building without water, without electricity. And she provides a safe haven for these children. The parents go out to beg, and they, she says to them, give me what you can at the end of the day. She washes them, she feeds them, she provides them with a safe place to be. Ruth is one of those silent heroes of society. And you cannot work and be in these spaces without being, leaving it unscathed. The inner city started to haunt my dreams as I had to try and reconcile my privileged life with everything that I'd seen and met within the inner city. But perhaps what moved me the most was the, the sense of community, the individuals that rise up, that rise up despite their circumstances, despite what they have, and the caliber of the, of the individuals that we met, the integrity, the intellect. And perhaps the greatest learnings of having done this documentary film and, and working within the inner city is best summarized in Desmond Tutu's quote, my humanity is bound up in yours for we can only be human together. And the reality is there is a humanitarian crisis taking place at the heart of Africa's wealthiest city. And it's a crisis that I'd say most of South Africans are not even aware exists. But I think the solution lies in a joint, joint effort of government, of NGOs, of civil society and the private sector. And I see my role in this and what perhaps has been my driving force is to ensure that history can never turn around and say, we did not know. And to end off, I'd like to leave you with a song from the rooftops of Johannesburg. And don't worry, I'm not gonna sing. Um, it's a man called Wise Man Shambari. Uh, he's a man with a passion for music, a dream to perform. And so I thought, what better platform than TEDx Berlin with you as its audience? May I present you Wise Man Shambari.